This is Adam Rubenstein from Chamberlain, and you are listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I'm your host, Keith, and we're back with a brand new episode. And I've got with me this week, returning guest and our guest co-host, Cole Stockton. Cole, welcome back. Thanks for having me, man. It's wonderful to have you back, Cole. You know, a lot has been going on in your world. We've got a new Easy Prey record out, Unrest. We've got Maul Walker being pressed onto vinyl. There's all kinds of things going on, Crazy, crazy stuff. And I have heard the new Easy Prey album, and I have to say, I really, really, really like it. That's awesome. Thank you, man. We're we're very, yeah. we're very, very excited. I mean, how has it been going? How is there a major buzz? Yeah, is there it's, uh, big show offers, TV offers. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, we're gonna do the tonight show. Is that Leno? I don't know. If yeah, he's yeah, still yeah. doing it. Uh, we um, we did the start of the pre order. I don't know, three, two, two or three weeks ago, and. I don't think I don't think it's sold out, but it's almost so we're, we're we just I think we just submitted a second pressing, uh, which is exciting. You know, it, it's one of those things you hope is going to happen, but, you know, you have no idea what's what's really going to happen. Um, so we're really stoked about that. And uh, because we're doing stuff that's working, I think we're going to maybe do some East Coast shows uh, later this year or early next year. We're not really sure. Uh, I think Philly, Philly and I don't know, some other places. New York City? Mm-hmm. Sound, sounds like it. So, um, but I don't, I mean, nothing is, we've, you know how these things go where you go, it's confirmed. And then you're like, ah, no, it's, it's not, it's not confirmed at all, but we're, uh, we're working through it. Nothing is confirmed these days. Yeah. No. Nothing. But you know what is confirmed, Cole, that we've got a banger, fire, hot show for the kids today. Hot emoji, fire emoji. 100 emoji. Our guest this week is the one, the only Wes Eisold. Of American Nightmare and Cold Cave. So awesome. Yes. Now, this interview is coming up in a minute, so strap in. And it's really, really, really good. And that's all I'm going to say. Right, Cole? That's right. That's that's all you need to say. You can vouch for that, right? Mm-hmm. I can. I heard the first nine minutes of it, and I'm not going to lie. It's fantastic. The first nine minutes are going to hook you. It's good. It, it got me. I, I can't wait to stop talking to you so I can continue. <laughs> <laughs> The first nine minutes are going to hook you, and then the remaining 53 minutes are just going to level you. (laughs) So it's really good, and it's coming up in a minute. But first, here's how you can support us, the new scene. Now, listen, there's been a flurry of activity here, a lot of follows, a lot of new subscribers. So I'm going to skip over that part and just say thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your support. You are really awesome. So here's how you can support us. Number one, shirts. Buy a shirt. Head over to Death Wish Inc. and search the new scene. We have a selection of t-shirts and a great long sleeve option. It's getting cooler out. Fall is coming up. The long sleeve's looking pretty good, huh? Those shirts are awesome, too. Oh, thank you. I love them. If it wasn't weird, I would wear them all the time. <laughs> Do you ever wear Easy Prey shirts? I mean... So, yeah, I mean, I have some. I don't know. It's weird. Like every time we do a new shirt, I'll grab one in my size and toss it in the closet. And then sometimes I'll come home and my wife is wearing one of them and it's cut differently. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's yours. That wasn't <laughs> supposed to be a memory for me. <laughs> I do the same thing. I get the shirts and I just put them in the closet and yeah. I, I just I just want one, you know? Yeah, I just want one of the things so I can in 15 years, I can be like, hey, Hey, little dude, remember when dad was cool? And he's like, nah, dad dad sucks. Never remember that. (laughs) Yeah, no. And uh, reviews. We need Apple podcast reviews. We got to get over 100, but we're getting close. Spotify, we're good. Thanks to everybody who submitted a review. And I have a new Apple podcast review I'd like to read now from Dirty Trevor. Five stars. Fascinating. It's a great interview podcast. I'll be honest. I listen closer when I know the artist. But it's always on point. Keep it rolling. Now, Cole, you know what that review tells me? That review tells me that Dirty Trevor listens even when he doesn't know the artist. And I think that's a great compliment. I think that's actually huge, honestly. I I think there's a lot of podcasts that I listen to where I learn, you know, kind of new, maybe a different perspective or learn about something that I've never heard of. And you trust the host because you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, uh, they're a curator. 
So they, they have a selection of things they want to show you and you get to listen to it as a, as a viewer or fan. Exactly. There are podcasts I listen to where I'm into the vibe of the show and the yeah. hosts. So I'm with them on the journey, you know? Totally. So thanks everybody for your continued support. Also support Iodine Recordings. Audio Karate just released a music video for Lovely Residence. This song is great. The video dropped and I got hooked on the song all over again. Check it out. If you haven't heard it, check it out. And The Darling Fire have a new single, Amber, that has just premiered at New Noise. Go check it out. That album's coming out next month. I can't wait. So let's talk about music recommendations, Cole. What are you listening to lately? I've got to know. So, I mean, I'm all, basically, I'm always listening to Page of the Lions. Like, it's the only thing I listen to for most of my life. Uh, new stuff. Uh, I, I feel like it's been like a, a weird season of great EPs. Is that, that Greet Death is killer. What is a, that Strange Joy out of Houston? Uh, they put a five-song EP out, I don't know, a month or two ago. It's killer. Something else, I, I don't know. I, it, it's a ton of, ton of just like short records that I've been listening to lately. And also that, that, that Gel record. Uh, they put an EP out recently, and then that record from the, theirs from uh, last year is just still on solid, constant rotation. There's a lot of good stuff out there, and I'm happy about that. Uh, here's a recommendation for you. The band is Fillets. And the song is The Lump in My Throat. This is really, really metal, like Norwegian black metal sounding. It's like that kind of vibe. And I don't ever listen to any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, same. But I was that sounds awesome. Yeah, I was watching a Twitch streamer and he plays metal songs while he's playing the game. And <laughs> awesome. the song grabbed me. So go check it out. And Cole, you'll be happy to hear that I got hooked on the Mall Walker EP again this summer. <laughs> <laughs> again I, i've been kind of sort of forced to i'm not forced it, it's really fun to listen to that stuff but we've been we're working on mall walker right now a lot uh we put you know we put it on the back burner for the easy Pay record and now we're we got you know Corey from glassing is playing with us and now we're about to add another member and we're we're looking to play a show in uh i think we're, we're booked in november so we'll uh we'll see, we'll see how that works that's awesome yeah the second song on the ep I could, I, it got stuck in my head and I couldn't remember who the band was. So, <laughs> so I listened to all the bands I know that sound like that. And, well, it was two different bands. And then I was like, oh, oh, great. It's Mall Walker. And awesome. then listening to that song again sucked me back into the EP. And you know, you know what? I can't wait for more. Uh, well, it, it's going to happen. We've, we've got a, at this point, we kind of have a bunch of material. So we're just trying to, f you know, flesh it out. And then I think we're going to go back into the studio. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, everybody, check back in with me and Cole in segment three. We're going to talk about the interview with Wes. We're going to dig into more of what Cole is up to. I might even talk about what I'm up to, which is just the show pretty much. But listen, that's good <laughs> stuff. So check back in with us. But right now, we are going to speak to Wes Eishold. Enjoy. We're here now with Wes Eishold. Wes, welcome to the show. Hi, Keith. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Wes. It's wonderful to have you here. You know, there's so much going on. You've done so much. We've got American Nightmare. We've got an exciting American Nightmare gig coming up at Furnace Fest this year. We've got a Cold Cave tour coming up. Cold Cave just put out a new record last year. We've got books. We've got it all. And we're going to cover all of that and more, Wes. But first, let me ask you, how are you doing today? Today, I am fine. I'm a bit lethargic and tired i was in boston for a week came home and then uh drove to seattle from los angeles and then drove back and got here like a day and a half ago but it was you know 40 hours of driving or something like that but i'm willing to do that to avoid uh airport interaction yeah, airports are a nightmare. I have for my job, I used to have to travel constantly. I'm talking constantly Monday through Friday. Right. So I'm like traumatized by airports. Yeah. If I can if I can drive, uh I prefer to do that. Yeah, I think just if I I got to that point from flying with gear and then just decided <laughs> it was just easier to not go through the hassle of losing stuff, breaking stuff, talking to people. I I have some look in my eye that TSA people just love touching me and I just <laughs> you know, I just will do anything to avoid it, including being tired days after a 40 hour drive. 
Yeah, and all the waiting around. I'm I'm incredibly anxious and impatient, and you know I like to be doing something at all times. So if I'm in the car driving, I can have a podcast on, I can have music on, I feel in control of the situation. If I'm just sitting in an airport staring at the floor, I'm going to go crazy. Yeah, I just start thinking of all the incompetent things I could be so much better, and then having no control <laughs> over it. Um, yeah, I'll just drive. What were you doing out in Boston? I was recording actually with uh american nightmare oh yeah breaking news this was going to be one of my questions so it sounds like there was new american nightmare material on the way yes i think so so it's not nothing's done there are songs that are close to done um i think it'll be a matter of having uh I, i flew out with brian masick the guitar player to alex the drummer's uh, studio house in Medford, Massachusetts, where we recorded our last single and album. And um, the three of us did our parts. And then it would be up to uh, Jim Carroll and Josh to get up there at some point in the near future. And if we're happy with it, we'll see. I like that approach. Just record it, see how you feel and go from there. Yeah, we have to answer to nobody. So uh, it's just done out of the love and want for wanting to continue making music together. And uh, there's no pressure on anyone. And, you know, there's no uh, agenda or people to answer to. We just are doing it if we feel like doing it. We play shows if we feel like playing shows. And if we don't want to release it or play shows, we don't do that either. So it's a nice place to be. <laughs> I, you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of bands on this show and recently, and I think. That's the benefit of being older and more in control of things. You're not broke ass kids out on the road, killing yourselves, you know, getting to the next record, getting to the next show, the weight of the world on your shoulders, because you feel like this has to build into something, you know, we're older now, we have lives, you can just do whatever you want. You can record and see how it goes. You can release it. You could not release it. You could put it out yourselves. The choice is yours. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We And that works for us. You know, it's everyone in the band lives far away from each other. They have their separate lives. They're doing their own thing. And we come together when it feels like the right thing to do. How does it work? Is it just a matter of timing and who's, you know, like I'm, I'm sure you guys are all busy with different bands and families or both various things. Is is it just a matter of timing and, and working it all out? Yeah, essentially there's a few pockets in the year where people are generally available. And, you know, I, I would, I think probably myself, I have the most conflicts, but Josh also has a pretty rigorous uh, job where there's definitely certain types of the year that are better than other times. And I guess that's why we typically play in like awful months to play in like January, February, stuff like that, because, (laughs) you know, it's just open for us. Otherwise I'm on tour or have shows or something like that. And uh yeah and he's busy with his thing and you know jim and jim's typically pretty open with his jobs i think he's able to come and go as he wants and Masic the same thing and al is works for himself too so i don't know i mean i we tried doing cycles like that when we were originally around you know rigorous touring and we did we toured nonstop for four years it felt like until we just burned ourselves out and um that's just not something i ever really returned to again with any band i've done since you know i I've t- I've t- I tore often and play often but in terms of answering to other people it's just not something that really clicked for me yeah same here in fact i i'm the type of person if someone tells me i have to do something there's pretty much a hundred percent chance i'm not going to even if it benefits me oh absolutely i mean you could get me <laughs> to do anything if you just told me not to you know but uh yeah yeah. Yeah. Tell me not to or structure it like you're asking like for a favor and I'm okay. But if you're like, <laughs> you need to do this, I'm like, well, it's never going to happen now. So we're fucked. Yeah. It's just some ingrained uh, instinct to go the opposite direction. Uh, it's it's worked mostly for me. So I just keep going with it. It's so deeply ingrained in me. There's no turning back. So you know what? I accept it. That's it. Likewise. <laughs> I like that. So let's go back. Let's go back, Wes, okay. to the beginning. Now, American Nightmare. Talk about around the time this band started and how it all got started. I was living in Portland, Maine 
trying to go to college for no good reason other than I didn't know what else to do. I had graduated high school in 1997 and had planned on not going to school. And then I got bored of that very quickly and enrolled really quick in a local college. Around the same time, I was in years leading up to that, all I did was go to shows. I booked shows, I did zines, and spent all my life in punk and hardcore for the years prior to that. It was my favorite thing. Shortly after that, and I guess in the meantime, I had tried doing bands that never really did anything or went anywhere and um, weren't satisfying or never recorded or anything like that. Then in 1999, my friends and I started a new band. I wanted to call it American Nightmare. I had planned to do a band called that in Maine, and uh, it never happened. Uh, I found myself spending a lot of time in Boston, even while I lived in Maine. And I would do uh, the drives multiple times a week to start practicing, rehearsing, and just going to shows and hanging out with my friends there. Um, Maine was a pretty small world for that type of music. There were people I knew and were friends with that were involved in punk and hardcore, but it was pretty isolating. And it was, you know, we're talking two to three people. I eventually moved to Boston uh, shortly after we put our demo out, I believe. And I think we played our first show in February of 2000. And um, since that happened, it was pretty much all in immediately. You know, yeah. my roommate at the time was Chris Rand, who does and did Bridge Nine Records. And uh, he helped us make demos. And after that, offered to do a seven inch for us. I think we had asked Equal Vision at the time if they were interested in doing it since one of our members was in a, uh, the band Pinard Fight that was previously on Equal Vision. And they weren't interested. Uh, they were asking us to do it after we released our second seven inch. So, and then, um, yeah, it was just a whirlwind. It went really fast. We didn't have much in common with, it's like we had a, a little in common with everyone and not much in common with everyone, you know? Yeah, that's one interesting thing about the band is it has more of a traditional hardcore sound, which makes sense because back then, I'm talking back in 99, 2000, I, I'm originally from Philly, Philly area. Okay. There was this dividing line of tough guys versus the crossover kids. And the tough guys would only like, quote unquote, real hardcore bands. So, <laughs> you know, like the, the traditional sounding yeah. stuff and the crossover stuff like Shy Halud and Converge or All Else Failed and all that, that they weren't so much into. But all, all the tough guys definitely loved American Nightmare. And it makes sense because it has that traditional hardcore feel. But what I like is the vocals. It has like more of a modern vocals. That's what I don't like about a lot of older hardcores. It's kind of just like, the the shouting and the just the tradition i don't know it's like i came in in 99 like with the most crazy stuff botch dillinger escape plan colesque all that yeah. so that that that's like my starting point but right. i think american nightmare balances the old and the new very well i think so too i mean i saw all those bands play they were definitely a part of um what i was into none of those were my favorite bands but i owned seven inches and records by those bands and saw them play often um so that was definitely in me um Converge, I liked a lot. And I thought that earlier Converge was sort of similar to what early AN was doing in a way. Like a song like Buried But Breathing, I think it's not too different than like a song on the first or second American Nightmare 7 inch. You know, it's rooted in pretty straightforward hardcore. <clears throat> but like you said, the vocals were more dire, maybe you'd say, more desperate, more screamed. And um, yep. yeah, I think like I remember it's funny you say that because I remember like a lot of like tougher people coming around to American nightmare after they spent time with us or like their girlfriends liked our band and they eventually like surrender, <laughs> surrender to it, you know? Um, <laughs> but it was sort of like that. I don't know. We, we weren't trying to impress anyone and definitely didn't care who liked our band. And uh, I did like that. There were people who looked um, like they were into different types of music at our shows pretty shortly after starting. Yeah, it seemed like things got started pretty quickly. By the time I heard about you, and I think someone linked me to like mp3.com or sent it through an instant message or something. And by the time that song had been sent to me, the buzz was already happening. Did things happen pretty quickly by the time you moved down to Boston and like the band was getting started? Yeah, well, there was a void in, in Boston at the time that 
was convenient for us. The bands prior to us had kind of stopped, you know, like, uh, like in my eyes or fast break or tenured fight had kind of broken up or like weren't, or had changed or whatever. And, uh, like in Boston proper, there was basically only, uh, this band called Riper Gade that was good besides bands like blood for blood or like harder, or more like punk bands. So we just sort of inherited the opportunity to play for these people who have been going to shows rigorously and uh, religiously. And some of them liked us and some didn't. But I think the difference between us and other bands in that area is that we were willing to just go tour immediately and play anywhere immediately. And I think like some of our, we toured with like kill your idols right away. And um, no one, I guess the idea for the band was to do the band, not to kind of do the band as opposed to a lot of bands do, you know? Right. How old were you when you moved down to Boston? I think I was 21. And at this point, were you dead set on just doing music? Did you have any other kind of thought in mind of what you might do? I never had a thought in mind of something else I would do uh, for the entirety of my life. I never, there was nothing else I wanted to do besides writing. And uh, my main attraction to writing was music related, lyrical. I love that because, you know, you describe uh, you're going to a lot of shows in high school and that's all you're doing and you're putting out zines. And that was me too. And I wanted to be in a band so bad and I kind of tried, but also kind of not really. So, you know, just the fact that you're able to put it together and be that focused at such a young age, I think is an awesome thing. Yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't hesitate at all. I was going to do it or die trying. And there was nothing in between. I had no one else to answer to. I had nothing else in my life. I wasn't in a relationship. I didn't care what uh, friends or family thought. Uh, this is what I was going to do, regardless of anything. And I didn't care about money. So I didn't care if I had a job or lost a job. And I didn't care if I was homeless. So I lived in closets and crashed on couches. And you know, I think that sort of uh, determination has back then, which came from a sincere place of desperation, you know, made it so there was no other option. You know, I was, I'm going to do this. Yeah. I think you really need that mindset. Like the stories I've heard on this show of the things people did, just moving around the country, living out of their car, living in closets like you're doing, you just, you have to do whatever you're going to do to make it happen. Yeah. Regardless of what your, what your focus is, you know, it just, it just takes dedication regardless. Absolutely. So you're in Boston, the band is touring things are picking up. Now, this is a great time for hardcore, a great time for a touring hardcore band. You eventually end up on Equal Vision, right? I mean, your label mates with Converge, they've got a big record uh, out. You guys have got a big record out. There's a lot of amazing bands out at the time. I mean, it, it was just an incredible time to be in hardcore and playing music in general. Yeah. And I think in retrospect, it felt incredible at the time too. When Converge brought us and the Hope Conspiracy on tour for, I guess, Jane Doe, it felt like something cool was happening. It wasn't just like another tour or, um, I don't know, it felt special. Maybe it was. Yeah, that's an incredible tour. I mean, that must have been amazing to be on that tour. Yeah, it was. I mean, we pretty much caravaned around the country together, the three bands. Yeah. you know, I heard a lot about the band at the time. You know, I've seen you before. Things are going well. Talk about that time. I mean, did you feel happy that your dream had come true? Were you happy with the direction of the band and and how everything was going? Uh, well, I don't feel that my dream came true. I don't. I still don't feel that. I think there's a level of I haven't been able to stop and uh, appreciate it or smell the roses. I think doing that would sort of uh, be a surrendering of sorts. So I just sort of um, I it's. I'm probably not going to be a great person to talk about the past. I don't don't know that much about it. I didn't spend that much time in it when I was in it. So I I just keep uh, looking forward really. But, you know, I I was happy with some of the music we made. I I loved making the first seven inch. Um, I loved making the second seven inch. When it came time to make an album, I was less into it. Why is that? Well, I just think, I think, um, I think some of the, violence in myself and in the music was lost when it came time to make a studio album 
in a studio with uh, someone producing it for a record label. I just, I don't know. I just, I, th- I think immediately something was lost in the band. It, it propelled the band when it came out and we went on to reach more people and that was amazing. But I think in terms of listening to the band, I think it, it was just such, such a, such a potent uh, unit in that first year. And so like by the time, you know, I think just by the time like the album came out, it, it, I was starting to s- shortly after that's not like the type of music I would have wanted to play anymore, you know? And then, but I was into what I was doing. I was into writing. I was into the vehicle that it had provided for me to reach people and to say things I needed to say in order to keep moving. But by the time the second album came out and by the time the band stopped, I was very ready for it to be done. There was a lot more that I wanted to do. And um, I think I had to make this uh, tough decision to stop being in the band in at the end of 2004 and sort of sacrifice it to go on and do other things that I wanted to create and explore other things, you know? So I was on tour. I was playing in like a part-time band and I had already left Boston for San Diego and was in like 2004. I had come home from, uh, I I guess like a European tour with American nightmare. And it it could have been late 2003. I can't remember, but I come up from tour so tired and passed out and woke up the next day to, uh, knocking on the door and I I answered it. And I had noticed that like, I didn't really know anyone in the apartment anymore. And there was like weird cats walking around looking hungry. And just like, I didn't recognize that my roommates, they weren't, they were different people. (laughs) And, uh, long story short, people had just like subletted the fuck out of the place until it was just like, no one was paying rent. So I get a knock on the door. I answer it. I'm jet lagged. So asleep. And it was, a one landlord and two police officers, uh, serving us eviction papers. And, um, they were kind of like looking behind me at the apartment. And like at that moment, I realized how like just destroyed and wrecked the place was. And like, you have to get out right now. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I just got here. I don't know what's going on. I lived here for a year, whatever. Can I, can you give me a little time so I can get my things and I'll help clean up and then I'll bounce, you know? And they're like, yeah, no problem, I guess. So I just bounced. I called Jake Bannon. He gave me a ride to the airport and I moved to San Diego that day. And then, um, I just was ready to get out of Boston. I was in a part-time band there called Some Girls. Uh, and then we had started playing a little more frequently. And um, I was, uh, after being in San Diego for a few months, I did a short tour of the East Coast with Some Girls. And at the end of that tour, I was supposed to fly to Europe again the next day for another American Nightmare tour. And I just couldn't do it. I was just, I was just worn out in several different ways. And definitely doing uh, another American Nightmare tour wasn't going to provide any help in that field so what did you do did you just call people and be like hey uh i can't do it i'm out yeah yeah basically that that could have been a direct quote even it was pretty it was pretty <laughs> brief what, i mean did you have to deal with a flurry of label and bandmate phone calls trying to keep you in or i mean what was like the response not really i mean it was it was sort of like shut your phone off and go do your thing you know i had to it's like now people like are fake concerned with mental health, but back then for sure they weren't. And then, um, you know, there was like promoters writing me pissed off because they had, you know, they'd like done, done so much work on the tour already and there was no way for them to make their money back. And it was just, you know, there was nothing I could do about it. I was just, I was fried, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I went to DC where my parents were living at the time shortly before they, uh, divorced there. And, um, I just spent a summer just doing, nothing but listening to music and writing. And then uh, once I had calmed, I moved back to uh, San Diego. Was Some Girls uh, based out of San Diego? It was, yeah. And how did you feel in that band? I mean, was that more your style at the time? Were you were you happier working with that band at the time? Not really. It was like, I liked making the first seven inch and I thought it was fun doing that band. But it, again, like I was, I ended up in this other situation where I wasn't playing I'm not saying this to demean like that band or like American Nightmare. I love I loved doing those bands at the time, but it still like wasn't what I had hoped to get to one day. So with some girls, it was just supposed to be like it was like a pickup game, you know. It was it was fun, and then there was no real other motive for it than just to kind of like fuck with people, I guess, you know. And um, <laughs> so it was sort of like my roommate apartment situation in boston uh, after doing that band for a year or two i looked around i was like i don't really know these people (laughs) 
So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to bail on this too. And then I uh, left San Diego for the East coast again and eventually ended up in Philadelphia. What year did you live in Philly? What years? Um, I think I moved there in 2006 and then I was there to like nine and then I moved to New York. But I, I lived several places in Philadelphia. I moved um, to Fishtown in like 2006 and then I lived in the Italian market and then I ended up and then I lived in Old City and then I bought a house in West Philly. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. 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 I lived in Philly from 03 to 2012. Yeah. So I was in Fishtown and Kensington the whole time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I loved, yeah. I loved living there at the time. Yeah, it's awesome. I still like going back whenever I can. I I usually never go to the city now, though, because my parents live in the suburbs. And, you know, it's just... What part is that? Uh, Levittown, Bucks County. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, I only only go on tour. Yeah, I don't really do much there or spend any time there anymore. But love playing there. Oh, yeah, it's great. Uh, Incredible, passionate music scene. I mean, that's that's where I got into the scene and shows and all that stuff. Yeah. So you mentioned you're in some girls, but it's still not exactly what it is you're looking for. I mean, what? I mean, it was refreshing at the time because there was uh, some version of freedom within that band, that, as opposed to American Nightmare was pretty boxed in stylistically. You know, the, the the minute changes we had made created criticism, and it was basically the same band with with American Nightmare. As opposed, so with some girls, um, I like the freedom of it, where I could say whatever I wanted. I was trying, I was writing differently. I could say anything I wanted to, and um, there, it didn't have to fall under any structure related to um, like, like hardcore, really. You know? Yeah, I definitely noticed that because well, with hardcore, especially back then, there's all these rules. Like it has to check these boxes, and it has to be kind of about this, and you can't do this, and you have to align with that. It would, I mean, there, there's just like this entire rule set, and then going through and looking at and listening to some girls. You know, it's this more dissonant kind of noisy hardcore, which I really like. And I saw that you had a song called I Need Drugs. And you know what? I could really relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was, um, I wrote that after going home for um, quitting American Nightmare and going home for the summer and a, a doctor telling me I should be on meds. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you end up going on meds? Oh, uh, I tried a couple of times, but didn't didn't keep. Yeah. I've tried the medication thing, uh, antidepressants, anti anxiety stuff but it, it just makes me really it just makes me more anxious or more tired i had the um, same experience exactly yeah so i i just you talked about uh the mental health thing mental health wasn't even a conversation uh 20 years ago and people are fake concerned about it now but what i found works best for me is i only give as much of myself as i can so i'll only be out for an hour or two at a time uh, if I go visit somebody, I don't stay overnight because it, I I have to do what works best for me. Like what works best for you? I mean, do you mean like you are best on a routine? Yeah, insane, uh, strict routines and uh, a lot of time by myself. Yeah, I mean, I think that's crucial, and I think I would benefit from that. I um, unfortunately, my my life doesn't allow for um, me to fall into any routine for too long because. I end up traveling often and you know and every, and every time I do that it's a different situation but um but yeah I think that is a super healthy thing and something that I'll probably get to eventually but um yeah the, the times where I do feel that I'm doing the best are when I'm home for a while and able to fall into a routine absolutely even when I'm traveling I can have little routines that help like there's hotel chains I like you know I can have a laptop with me and I'll watch certain stuff before I have to go do things that I do. Yeah. Yeah. All important. Okay. So you're in some girls. At what point do you leave this band? I left the band too. Yeah. It was 2000, I think six, I think, yeah, probably six. I, it was definitely after I had moved to Philadelphia, we played like a couple more shows after I lived there. And then I just wasn't into it. And it seemed like it had run its course. And, um, you know, it's like it's both both American Nightmare and that band um, had new music that the bands had written, and those unfinished songs sent to me just sort of converged in a negative way with my waning interest. And then uh, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't sing on these songs. You know, I, I just, I'm not feeling it. Just, they're not uh, extracting anything from me. And um, so. I left some girls, not before a tour, but 
I was just like, I'm done you now. And that was that. And by that point, I had began trying to make my own music and had a hunch that it could be fulfilling um, to do that by myself without waiting around for people to make m- music that I wasn't necessarily attached to. Yeah, you know, I've heard you talk about this, and I really feel you on this. My whole life, I had been in bands or just waiting to get into a band. And, you know, the band would end for one reason or another. I never got it into my head that I could create my own destiny and make things happen until, I don't know, five years ago. And I finally did a band that I created when I was 35 years old. And I mostly wrote everything. And it it was finally exactly what I wanted instead of me compromising and, uh, you know, with someone else's vision. And it sounds like that's what you started to do with the beginning of cold cave as well. Exactly. And, um, yeah, that, that's what it takes. And I'm sure that when you did that, you know, you, you realize if you had done bands before that it's difficult to start over. And I think a lot of bands and musicians and artists, they fear, losing relevance or losing a fan base. And so they would rather beat something to death as opposed to taking the risk of failure with starting something that you might actually love. And um, I had no fear of being relevant or irrelevant. I just didn't care either way. So I was happy to start a new project that was fulfilling to me, um, regardless of if it caught on or people liked it or if anyone connected with it or if it made money or if I got show offers or if I got a record deal, I was just going to do it regardless. And um, I think being willing to um, slink further into the underground was beneficial to me and um, allowed Cold Cave to stand on its own legs as opposed to being like a continuation of bands before it. And of course, in some ways it is, and in many ways it's not anyway, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's certainly a departure from American Nightmare and some girls, but there, there's a bit of an edge to it as well, you know, so it, you, it could be similar in that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. And them- thematically, you know, it's all, it's all coming from the same place. So right, there's crossover, but yeah, I don't know. It was just rewarding to um, try again, regardless of if, if it worked, you know, I had, yeah. just like, like you said, I had, it hadn't really clicked with me or that I was able to do this void of anyone else's help and and, until one day when it was and i just went for it and was pleasantly surprised i remember playing demos like for friends like early demos i made and they like thought it was like funny you know it's like super minimal (laughs) electronic music but like they didn't know where it was coming from or like what it was referential to and etc and then i'm still here doing it oh yeah i mean absolutely that's the thing is that's another thing i've learned is you just have to keep doing what it is you're doing. Well, one, you have to be passionate about it. Otherwise, like, it's just going to fizzle out. You know, I can't keep doing something that I'm not into uh, just because of whatever. I mean, it sounds like the same for you. Like, American Nightmare certainly could have just kept going. The demand was certainly there. Some girls certainly could have kept going, but your heart wasn't in it. So you move on and then you, uh, you're you just putting your focus into this new thing and look what it's built into. Yeah, exactly. And like, yeah, I mean, American Nightmare could have yeah, I definitely could have rode that out for a while. There was lots of label interest at the time. There was major label interest. Um, I was being flown places to meet people. And it just like wasn't what I wanted to do, you know? And um There was major label interest. Yeah, we yeah, there was. And then um Did you meet with any executives or anything like that? Yeah, when MCA before MCA records uh disintegrated, we were out there, you know. Wow. Out here where I live now. But um yeah. I, we didn't, this wasn't, wasn't the path. Yeah. You know, I respect the fact that you can just walk away from these things pretty easily if it's not what you're into. Because when I was younger, I used to think, oh, I would do anything to just be a part of this, even if I didn't like it. But I don't think that's true because I've been in plenty of bands where I didn't really like what was going on. And I walked away pretty quickly too. I think I had some weird advantage slash disadvantage with ending things because of how I grew up, I was moving all the time and uh, yearly, like like some annual, like tear from whatever life I had created in the year prior. So it wasn't that difficult for me to start over again and uh, walk away from things, knowing that when one door closes, another one will most likely open. And 
that's mostly been true so far. Yeah, it's good that you had that knowledge at such a young age. I figured it out in recent years, but uh, you know, my mentality used to be like, well, this band's over. That's the last band I'll ever be in. But no, even if you don't really try, something else always comes up. It does. I think I think it's beneficial to go into things uh, fearless as opposed to wondering if it'll work out okay, you know, because it's not going to help you yeah. either way. So talk about the beginning of Cold Cave. How do you get it started? How do you figure out how to do this thing by yourself? I got lucky in that me starting. So like, do you remember like in, I don't know if you remember in 2006, 2007, the black Apple laptop comes out and that is installed with this super basic version of GarageBand that sat on my computer. I didn't know what it was or how to use it. And then um, I had acquired a couple of synthesizers from thrift stores or, and some pedals from friends who lent them to me. And all I wanted to do at a time, I, I had my trajectory of listening to music at that point had basically gone further away from structured music. And I was just super into like noise at the time in 2005, 2006. And I just wanted to make noise, non-structured music. And I had these pieces of equipment. I started playing with them. I got a drum machine. I started playing that. One day I turn on GarageBand. I plug it all into that through trial and error. And, um, my ideas for making noise sort of disintegrated into um, song structure against my wish. And then, uh, (laughs) but I liked it and it reminded me of like very crude versions of music that I love and listen to growing up that made me feel alive. And um, I just went with it, you know, and then I, I had asked, um, I had, you know, I'm, friends with all these other people at the time who were in different music worlds and shared it with them and they offered to put it out. It was appropriate for their labels at the time. And, um, it just sort of blossomed from there. And I started, I got started getting show offers all of a sudden. I was like, what the, I don't know how to do this live. I have no way. I I don't know how to do this (laughs) real. And then, um, I had to figure something out. So I had, uh, the house I had bought in Philly, I had two friends living with me and do you guys want to be in in this live band? said, yeah. And we just sort of hacked our way until we figured it out, you know? That's the thing with like doing sort of like such crude music. People have a hard time judging it, whether you're doing a good or bad job. <laughs> so you just sort of do whatever you need to do and then uh, until you get better. Yeah. How were those early shows? I mean, how did you piece it all together? What kind of elements were you working with live? Just different synthesizers and like oscillators and um, pedals making noise basically synthesizers through distortion pedals on top of a drum machine. You know, that's basically it. Yeah. Did you have to figure out how to play a synthesizer and sing? That sounds like it would be really hard. Yeah. It, 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 well, fortunately, everything I had written was so like simple because I only have one hand. So it was easy to play it live for me too with two other people. So it was just like sort of just holding it, holding down notes basically with very, very slow melodies over it, you know? Yeah. I remember like we had already had like a 12 inch out before we played our first show. And these people, I remember this, like we played our first show in the basement of this, like, I forget the name of it in, in New York city in in the East village, this couple had flown from Japan to see our first show. And I remember them like just looking so like bummed after our first show and being like, that's not what the record sounds like or what we thought it was going to be like, you know, and they were right. It it was nothing like it. (laughs) That is unbelievable. You're telling me a couple flew from Japan and they were at your first show. Yeah, the first Cold Cave show. Yeah. Did you talk to them? Um, I apologized on the way out. (laughs) Well, I mean, hopefully they're still fans. Cold Cave has come a long way since. (laughs) It's possible. (laughs) That's pretty incredible, though. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I've said this before and I hate sounding tired, but um yeah, I did. I just when I when I started this band, I, I didn't want I didn't want any uh, real connection to the bands I had done before. So I, I tried to stay as anonymous as I could for as long as I could when I first presented the music. You know, I didn't put my like my name in the records or anything like that. I just wanted them to exist, and I put like pictures of people who are probably dead on the record covers. You know, just to sort of throw people off. You know, did it work? It totally worked. Like so, the first twelve inch is like this couple like their faces and on the back of the record is them standing fully nude and people thought that was the band that they were going to see you know yeah then i also i would pitch shift my voice 
for the female vocals in the band. So people thought it was like, you know, this, this duo and it just, it wasn't. Wow. You know, and I think that's a pretty brilliant move because it's new to everybody that way. And then there's none of this association with the scene and all the baggage that comes with that. You can just start fresh. Yeah. And I had seen that happen to like people I knew or like knew of who were people in like popular hardcore bands try making their new band and it just being stigmatized to hardcore. Like it's just a hardcore band, but it sounds different, you know, when it, when it had little in common with it actually, you know, and I just didn't, I didn't want that. I was fine playing shows to no one, you know, I, I would have been cool with that. Yeah. Especially with, um, especially within hardcore. And if it, like, you know, the, the path used to be you're in a hardcore band, then you're in a post hardcore or emo band. So if you're jumping to a more new wave noise type of thing, that's, I mean, come on. Like, I think you're one of the first to do that. A lot of bands are doing that now, but certainly you're one of the first, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I think now it's no big deal. And that's nice that it, it that's come, come around. But at the time, yeah, it was like you said, that was, yeah, you're supposed to do hardcore band to like emo band or something. Right. Exactly. Right. Now, it might just be because I'm old and more out of touch, but it seems like... Oh, do you feel that old? I don't I don't feel old. I think I'm older than you. I don't feel old. How old are you? I'm 43. Okay, I'm 40. I I don't feel old at all. Unless, I guess unless I'm talking to like a 20-year-old and they call me old. I, well, I don't... Yeah, I guess I don't talk to 20-year-olds. So, <laughs> I guess that's the difference. I don't feel... Um, I don't feel old. I guess I would... I, I don't feel old. You know, I don't feel old at all unless I sleep weird and then like my neck hurts or there's some kind of new pain and I'm like, oh no, what's going on? Because I guess none of that used to happen. But no, I don't feel old. I get up at like 10. I start working at 11. Uh, I'm playing video games all night. I'm having fun doing this podcast. So uh, I'm kind of living the dream right now. Great. That's great. Yeah. And uh, you must feel the same way. I mean, you get to create this music and various excellent bands. You're out on tour, right? Yeah, uh, often. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that you're not really looking at the present so that you you don't really get to appreciate it as much. Has that changed at all at your age now? Like, are you able to stop and kind of take a look at what you're doing and just say, hey, this is pretty good? Or, do you, or are you still in that same mindset where it's like, on to the next thing, can't really think about it. I get glimpses of it, but it's pretty much on to the next thing. You know, I don't see the point in reveling in anything. I just, I, I think it's not a comfortable place for me for probably various reasons, but enjoying something, uh, reveling in a moment or a memory or an achievement of sorts, it's just, this is not, it's never really uh, been my thing. That makes sense. Yeah. If I do, it's very brief. And uh, right. I get really freaked out whenever anybody says something nice about me, like almost to the point of panic. Do you get like that too? I do. I can relate to that for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've gotten good over the years at just like giving like a sincere thank you back to it. But um, it's not something I can really like, it doesn't really hit when it goes in one ear, you know? Yeah. My brain simply will not allow me to process it. Someone said something nice about me the other day and I, I thought they were talking about something completely different and they're like, no, you. And I'm like, oh, so I, I, j- I used to panic so much. I just had to train myself to say a nice thank you and then move on to the next topic of conversation. Yeah. I think that's okay to stay, you know, just stay focused and humble. I think it's fine. Exactly. That's the way to go. So in 2011, around then, American Nightmare reunites, yes? Yes. Okay, so talk about this. Were you guys in touch? Did you like each other? Did you hate each other? Uh, how does this come about? I wanted to do it. Um, and I was in touch with some of the people and then some of the people less in touch with. I, it, you know, not that long had gone by since anyone had spoken to anyone, whether it was like just like a boring business email like whatever something over the years you know and then uh I said do you guys want to play a show everyone wanted to do it you know i mean it's fucking simple i don't know what to say <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah i mean i just had i had uh i had an urge that i wanted to play this music again i was able i, I had enough just dis- i had enough distance from it to appreciate it and um yeah i just wanted to to play that makes sense. There was a time where I was distant from hardcore, never gone, but you know, I got into post-hardcore, post-rock, 
different things. Uh, and then I was like in a coma high for about 15 years. So I had to deal with that. But once I came out of that, I just reconnected with everything I loved. What do you mean a coma? Oh, n- not like an actual coma, but uh, there was many years that I was very high and drunk. And those oh, are right. kind of lost, lost years. years. Right. Yeah. I had to, had to kind of get out of that. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't feel like detached from music at all. But yeah, I guess there was a part of me that wanted to experience that energy again. I was actually pretty busy with Cold Cave at that time. I just put out like a record or two and um, was on tour and just I wanted the experience of the other band. You know, I thought enough time had gone by and um, yeah, it was it, it, it was pretty. I think up until the day that I asked everyone if they wanted to do it, it had not crossed my mind as something I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, it was pretty sudden. And there really is nothing like that experience. It's the best feeling. Yeah, it's one of them for sure. Was it weird to get back together with everybody and, you know, after all that time and practice again? Or was it just like, no, nope, I'm doing it? It was mostly like I'm doing it. I guess, yeah, probably a, a little weird. But um, pretty much everyone in the band had been playing music in some form the entire time that American Nightmare was in a band. So it wasn't like everyone showed up like super obese and didn't know how to hold their instrument or something like that. Like it, like everyone knew what they were doing still and was pretty like well oiled. And then um, and we were still like, this is a while ago now. So yeah, we were like th- early thirties. You know, I think if we had to get together now for the first time in our early forties, it'd probably be a little different and a little more rusty and hard, but it, in a way only like, I don't know, six, seven years had gone by which seemed like an eternity then, but now seems like nothing. So I don't know. It was a little weird, um, but felt pretty comfortable. I guess like we did our first two shows and then wanted to do more. So I guess everyone was into them. But, you know, like you started, it's like, it is like getting back together with an ex or something like that at the same time, you know? And it's like, people always say like a band is a relationship and it's so like, everyone's heard that before, but it is very true and you usually leave relationships for a good reason you know so yeah we had to um sort out a few things and then um fast forward to now it's in a really healthy place that's really good yeah i think with time and age and maturity and all that stuff it's everything's not as big a deal you know i didn't leave my first band on the best terms but if we ever got back together and played again i would certainly approach things differently yeah, it's easy to it's easier, I think, to appreciate for some people the gift, the gift of being able to play music, you know. And I think some people just act like they're supposed to be there on stage or the greatest thing to ever exist, and <laughs> the world should do whatever they want, and everyone should listen to them. And it doesn't typically fare well for people with that mentality. And then there's people who are a bit more humbled and um, feel lucky to do it, or or indifferent to do it in a positive way. And um, I think that that can be a healthy approach to playing music. It's like when your head gets clouded by outside influence or um, I don't know, that's when things can go pretty awry. Yeah. If you, if you get too full of yourself, you're going to get into really dangerous territory really quickly. I, I think that disconnection that you're talking about is healthy. And I, I kind of do that. I just stay laser focused on the next thing. I just want to keep producing and not think about things too much. Yeah. And, and I also like love when people are totally full of themselves and fucking blow it too. Like that's really fun to watch also, you know, <laughs> it is the best, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when you had all the legal trouble with your name and there was the other American nightmare? Of course. Did you ever talk to them? Like, cause you both lived in, they were from Philly, right? I be- Yeah, I believe so. Somewhere in the, somewhere in the philadelphia area i never i never talked to him no and then i don't okay. i don't think anyone from our band ever had a conversation with him uh, and I, I i can't imagine it it was probably a good idea on their end i can't imagine it would have gone too well um <laughs> you know but um yeah because i'm just thinking like two philly area bands you know you know how philly people are there could be some beef maybe it could end badly yeah, it would not have ended bad for us. I know that. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't think it was like a, they weren't like a real, uh, you know, they weren't like a, a band, band. You know, I think it was just like, they didn't like that. Um, I think that because American Nightmare had 
such a presence in Philadelphia pretty early on. I think it just caught their attention and they didn't like it, you know? Yeah. And fair enough. Is there some satisfaction now that all these years later that you have the name and that your band is still around and theirs isn't? No, I mean, I'm happy to have the name back, but I literally never think about that band or like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it comes up in interviews and like, that's the only time I ever think about it. You know, I don't, I was fine when we didn't have a name too. I, I, it's, it's whatever. Yeah. I mean, give up the ghost is a really cool name too. I think it aged a bit. Okay. At the time yeah. it was, it was strange for us and for other people. I think that was, that was the working title for um, the record that became we're down to we're underground. And um, I actually found like a, a, a couple months ago, I was going through some stuff and I found a list of band names that we were trying to, that were, that were in the running. I can't remember most of them right now, but they were in the running to replace American nightmare and give up the ghost seemed like the least harmful at the time, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. Hey, can you send me that list? My band now is in uh, a big argument trying to name the band, and maybe I could uh, pick something off there. It's funny, like th- I, like three of the names on that list are bands now. You know, so I think <laughs> they were they were decent names. So coming up this September, Sunday, September twenty fifth, American Nightmare will be performing at Furnace Fest. Yes, yes, I am looking forward to it. Now, this is exciting. Have you been to the fest before? No, I haven't. I saw some photos and videos from last year, and I had never seen anything prior to that, like from from when it used to exist or whatever. So I, unbeknownst to me, it, there are actual furnaces involved, which I thought looked incredible. It was very industrial. Yeah, it's the, it's the most unique concert grounds I have ever been to. And the fest is unbelievable. I was there in 2003, because I was uh, doing merch for a friend's band and I did go last year. So you're going to have a blast. It is an unbelievably awesome fest. Do you know what stage you're playing? I don't, but I like going to festivals in cities or countries where you don't often think would have a certain type of festival. Like I I love doing that, you know, like for American Nightmare probably wouldn't go to Alabama, you know, like we probably would be difficult for us to get there if there weren't like a huge, uh, well-organized festival exactly yeah it was cool to be down there because i wouldn't be otherwise the only time i've ever been to alabama has been on tours and so it's nice to be down there and the great thing is literally every band i've ever liked plays this festival in one weekend so it's it's basically the only show i have to go to all year oh that's cool yeah get get it over with one stop shop (laughs) i guess that's the idea yeah but i'm excited you know um i haven't seen American Nightmare, like we, we toured, um, I got Bale brought us on tour, I think in 2001 or two. So I'm looking forward to seeing a Avail A Bale is playing too. A Bale is playing too. I almost like don't even pay attention to the lineup until I get there, which is weird. But then I start looking at the day to day lineup and I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is like unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty great. So in 2021, Cold Cave put out a new record fate and seven lessons now first let me say i think this is your best release yet i love the record how is everything going did you get sidelined by the pandemic and have to sit on it for a while like how is everything going with this record yeah i mean yeah we had a pretty firm date of when it would be back to us to send out to the world and like naturally that didn't happen so it i think we waited almost six months after the date we were promised to have them which is it's no big deal people were really cool and understanding about it you know that record was made during the lockdown and released during the lockdown so um i haven't i'm happy with it you know it's just strange because i haven't i've been able to play those songs still really yet because I played a couple of festivals and then I had a couple of shows that were album specific. So there's this record that we put out that's, you know, time is moving on and we haven't really been able to perform these songs live yet. So I'm looking forward to doing that in the near future. But I think making that record and then everything else that Amy and I did during the pandemic, it was really healthy to have something to focus on and uh, multiple projects to focus on. You know, I wrote a lot during that time. Um, I communicated with people a lot during that time. Um, I supported people a lot of the time. I was buying records, ordering books from all over the world nonstop. And 
uh, karmically people were doing that to us too. And it kept us alive. We own a bookstore here in Los Angeles and it was obviously closed for a while. So that was nerve wracking and stressful. And through all these releases we were doing and, um, people's generosity with, uh, ordering things from us, we were able to survive. And, uh, it was really a beautiful thing. You know, I've been, I've been, I've been collecting books and records for as long as I can remember. And, um, it's, it's really fun to be on the other side of that too, you know, and it just, we far exceeded anything that we thought we were going to do. That's great. And that's great that people were able to support you because the bookstore has been around for a little while now, right? Yeah. So it, it originally opened in 1989 and then Amy has owned it for, I think close to 14 years now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing I, I know the pandemic was bad for so many people and is still bad for so many people. But one thing I'm grateful about is that I had a lot of things to keep me occupied. Like this podcast launched, I think, right when lockdown started to happen. And I decided to take it weekly and it's been working out okay. And I I just had plenty of friends and support and things to keep me focused through, uh, through the worst parts of it. And it sounds like you had that too, which is great. Yeah. I think that was I think that was uh, humankind's instinct, uh, survival, instinctual move was just to focus on something and to work. I think like, you know, we're supposed to work. We're supposed to do things that make us feel good. And uh, we're supposed to invest our time and energy into those things. And I think when you have this looming uh, fear and of clouds of doom that the world may end or we don't know what's going to happen and just the uncertainty of everything. I think, uh, a lot of our, a lot of people's instincts kicked in and got a lot of productive things done. You know, they really did. I, it must be instincts because my life changed instantly. Like I, I don't know. I just went right to YouTube and I, I was watching like this 30 hour gameplay video to get me through the day. And I got deep into YouTube I took the podcast weekly and I, I didn't even think about it. I, was, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to start doing these things. They just instantly started to happen. I guess the brain does crazy things in times of stress. Yeah, exactly. And fight or flight. So you have some books out too. Now there's a trilogy of books. We've got Plague Poems. We've got Year Zero, A World with No Flowers. And we've got Ghost Radio. Yes? Yes. That's like the latest uh, three books I was a part of. So you're really doing it all. Music, owning a bookstore, writing books. You're getting it all done. Uh, yeah. I mean, I got to do something. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would not want to do anything. You know. Do you find yourself working on things just all of the time? I'm like that. Yeah. I mean, I work, I'm my own boss. I'm, I answer to myself. So I work all day, every day, you know? I don't take, yeah. I don't take breaks from it. I don't take vacations, you know, in moments of peace. I'm still thinking about things I want to create. Yeah, I I find that too. My, I'm always fantasizing about having a day to do nothing. And then if there is a day where I do nothing, I'm more miserable than if I was just working all day. Like if I'm in front of the computers creating content and working on stuff and doing all that, I think I think that's I think that's the way to go. Yeah, for sure. For me. Do you find that as well? Yeah, I can't um I can't step away, you know, everything will fall apart and I'll lose too much momentum, um, mentally, you know, how do you balance it with a uh, family life and life with your partner? It's all intertwined. You know, my partner and I do everything together and our child's there with us with everything that we do. You know, he, he doesn't go to school. He never has. I don't think he ever will. And, um, we just do it. it I don't, I think you just, you just figure it out. You know, I love that. Everybody's on the same page and helping each other out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, life is so short that I don't see the reason. I don't see any reason to do it any differently. How old is your kid? Six. So no school is uh, in the works? No school. I mean, geez, these days, you you never know what's going to happen. Well, yeah, there's that too. Exactly. Um, I felt stifled by school. I felt it. I didn't. I don't feel like I benefited uh, anything really from school. I hated school. I still have nightmares about school. It was not a great experience in any way for me. I, I would say that it contributed to many of the issues I still have today. Exactly. So imagine the possibility of just avoiding all that. I think why would why would you not try? I don't think anyone went to school and like had some amazing experience or turned out so spectacular that it's not worth trying something else. You know. So 
that's sort of the idea behind it. Absolutely. You were either a jock uh, who peaked in, I don't know, eighth grade and had a wonderful experience in school, or you were a kid like me who went there and had a very not good experience every day and came home very upset every day. Exactly. And that was me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's what we're going to do, folks. Number one, we're going to catch American Nightmare at Furnace Fest on September 25th. Yes? Yes. Yes, everybody. All right. Everybody, you have to. You have to. We've got a Cold Cave tour dates beginning in September. Yes? Yeah, like festivals and one-off shows, basically. But yeah, there's dates in September. So go check those if you can. If you haven't heard the latest Cold Cave record, Fate and Seven Lessons, go check it out. It's wonderful. Pick up one of the books. There's plenty of ways to support you, Wes. I'm a big fan of everything you do. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you, Keith. And good luck with the podcast. And there you have it, Wes Eisold. Now, that was a really, really good conversation. And you know, sometimes after I speak to somebody, like I'll be laying in bed at night and, and I'm like buzzing and I, and I can't sleep and I'm just thinking about the conversation and putting the episode together. And this was one of those times. That was, that was great. I, I had never spoken to Wes. I've never met him. I've never even heard an interview with him before. Yeah. So I... uh I didn't know exactly what to expect. And he's just a really interesting guy. He had like really interesting takes on everything. Yeah. I mean, he's been doing this for, he's been in the act active in the scene for so long. Uh, he just has an interesting perspective on all that stuff. Big time, you know, talking about, uh, American nightmare. And I didn't know they were being courted by major labels. That was interesting. And how he just like walked away from it at the very height and, and was able to do that and, and just, and you know, going into Cold Cave and just figuring out how to do things on his own, it was a, it was a really good story, and he was uh, super super interesting to talk to. Uh, like a year or two ago, uh, Chris, who's the singer in Mall Walker and Easy Prey, Chris and I did a podcast called I think it's called Punk Rock Lotto, and the 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 stick is they give you a year, and you have to pick a record that came out that year, and you talk about it for. I don't know, two hours. And it, we went back and forth. Uh, just, I immediately wanted to do, um, you know, at the, when the record was released, it was Give Up the Ghost, but it's American Nightmares, Down to War Underground, came out in 2003. And we went back and forth going, how, how are we going to talk about this for an hour or two hours? And we ended up doing that. Um, and so uh, it's not, I, mean, I, I don't suggest like it, to driving any traffic there necessarily because I hadn't seen Chris in quite a while due to COVID. So we sat there and like, I don't know, drank a bunch of beer and yelled about hardcore for an hour and a half, whatever. Um, <laughs> but like uh, one of the things that we in talking so much about that record beforehand, one of the things that we realized like drove us to that band is it's tough music that's not tough. Yes. And yes, that and that's one thing I talked to him about yeah. was like, that the tough guys really embraced them and liked them, but they, they had a different aesthetic, Absolutely. you know, the, the concept of like, you know, like when you're a kid and you listen to, I don't know, like guns and roses, I'm 39, but like what are any of those Nirvana, maybe in the beginning, it's like, Oh, this music's dangerous. And it wasn't really, but like, that was the, the, the motif. Uh, but like you listen to older, older, Amer really any American nightmare and like, it's dangerous, but not, to the viewer it's dangerous to the band like it is like it it sounds like it hurts to do um in all of the right ways like it's it's full of emotion and it's aggressive and it's fast it's just it, it's just they're just one of those bands as i was putting this episode together i kept listening to am pm and reading the lyrics and i was just like wow this is like really good yeah it's it's on a level that i think a lot of bands at that time or at least bands that i was exposed to maybe there's tons of bands that were doing it but uh in in my limited exposure in like the early 2000s listening to hardcore i was like oh this guy's actually like telling a story and these are personal situations it's not just like oh, i'm gonna punch you in your neck that's not a song I don't, that's that's a bad song but you know that, that's the, that you know it's, it's not it's not that at all which is why it's so great yeah yeah great conversation thanks so much Wes for coming on the show you know he's got a great fashion sense too and I can really appreciate that yeah that 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 dude's awesome <laughs> yeah. yeah I saw a picture of him wearing this shirt I wish I knew him he's wearing this great shirt 
I wanted to be like, where did you get that shirt? <laughs> and where where can I where can I get that shirt? Yeah. <laughs> excellent conversation. Excellent conversation. So, Cole, let's talk about how we are doing. Now, we mentioned some of I'm going to start with you, Cole, because people hear from me enough, you know. I think we can always hear from you more, but yes, sure. We people know what I'm up to. I'm doing the show, I'm playing some games, yada yada yada. So, we talked about it in the beginning a little bit. Easy Prey has got a record, a new record out, Unrest. Now, I have listened to this whole thing, Cole. I have to say my favorite tracks are Ethical Drift featuring Tim Singer yeah. and Full Table Empty Stomachs. Yep. Wow. Yeah, those are it. Those are great. Uh, Full Table is a really fun live song. Um it, it 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 was a challenge for us writing. You know, we all of that record was written during well it's still covid still happening so it's not like <laughs> during covid but um you know especially during lockdown like i was uh, unemployed basically i mean you know i was on I, was, I got furloughed from work and so we had a ton of time to you know we have a we, currently it's actually about to get turned into condos but we have a, a huge practice space so we were able to kind of comfortably be in that room uh, without being, you know, weirded out. I mean, I, I don't know. We were masked and whatever. It was such a weird time. But um, so we spent, you know, we were, we were up there three nights a week working on new material. And so all of it was written in a vacuum where we did not play live at all. And so like, you, you know, part of working out, you know, new materials, you finish the song. It, this is great. You play it live. That song sucks. Um, <laughs> let's fix it. And, you know, that, that's how that works. It's like a, a, you know, it's a process. And that didn't happen. So all of this has been done completely, you know, insular. And, and, you know, we've since played some of these songs live and whatever, but, um, so it was a, it was a challenge to do some of these and some, and then you start playing shows and you go, well, this song is super, you know, full table, a fun song to play live it has that, you know, it's, it speeds up in the middle of it and it's super dumb and we get to be all crazy. And I don't know, it's a, it, it, we're, we're very, very excited about the record. Yes. Yes. It's excellent. And I can't wait for all of you to hear it too. Go check it out. Really, I mean, it's great. I'll throw a track on our new scene 2022 Spotify playlist. So if you follow that, there'll be a track on there. But go hear the record as well. And I was curious, how did you guys hook up with Tim Singer? I remember you talking about him coming by when, uh, uh, like before. You know, it's another one of those weird pandemic things where since nobody can tour, everyone's on the internet entirely. And, uh, you know, Bitter Branches put out that ep maybe right around when we put out our last ep and so you know the two things are featured together sometimes or whatever they get compared to each other and uh we just became friends with it re really chris our singer became friends with tim uh just through instagram and chris is a you know massive dead guy fan and uh, massive everything you know all all the bands that tim has been in have been incredible so so they you know they became friends that way and uh we started chatting about guest spots um i guess i hadn't realized the songs that i have heard that he's guested on i didn't realize he was on that uh that every time i die song um it's just i don't know it's just he's he's done so much uh and so we asked him and he was so quick to go i'm, I'm in and he sent us you know multiple tracks of just hey here's here's one here's another idea and all of it was kind of gold so we just kind of picked and chose and uh, went with it it was it was really it was a really cool experience it's so also so weird doing that entirely long distance yeah but it was it was awesome that's what i was going to ask how do you do it so he just sends you tracks and you clip them and drop them in however you choose sort of so you know we had we had finished uh, we didn't know exactly what song he, we were going to have him on we initially said stupidly hey you're going to come to practice and we're going to write a song with you well the song we wrote was awful because we didn't try very hard i mean we were just like <laughs> he's here <laughs> what do you got i got i got this one bad riff cool that's it we're that's the song so we um yeah i think we maybe kept a bit or something i don't know but um we we weren't entirely sure what we were going to have him do and then as the record took shape it was really clear we wanted him on that song and um so we sent it to him and he was in and we sent all of the you know master files to the studio he i, I assume just normally records that uh and uh, they took it and he did some takes and sent us little videos of it and that was it was awesome we were, we were really stoked about it that's really awesome yeah it's a great record you should be proud yeah we're really excited it was the you know we we write um we write together for sure um you know I, I bring a lot of just like bass song ideas in and then yeah especially matt our drummer the two of us you know kind of 
figure out how it's supposed to go and what, what transitions are. But this is really the first easy pay record that um, I've had such a hand in uh, the the vocals. Uh, I don't sing, but you know, I, I Chris would give me a sort of concepts what he wanted, and I would kind of give him just a bulk uh, lyrics, and he would kind of go from there and figure out what worked for him. I like that. Everybody writing together. Yeah. So in essence, it's a, it's a very personal record that I did not write by myself, which is really cool. So Mall Walker has a vinyl release now of the EP on Better Days Will Haunt You. It does. I have one. You have one. It's crazy. Is it colored? No, it's black. Oh. Mm-hmm. Is there colored? Was there colored? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, Mall Walker is a band that um, anything outside of songwriting, I have nothing to do with. <laughs> it's just I, that Easy Prey takes up just a little bit too much of my time. So Matt and I write all the, all the music and then um, Matt's in charge. So uh, Matt's our drummer. And he um, so he he connected with God. I don't remember his name. The, the, it's such a sweet, guy, sweet guy from um, Better Days. And um, he uh, he's super into it. And uh, he's uh I don't know. It, it's, it's, it was such a, it was very, it, it took me by surprise because there was a 80 e- email long chain that I just sort of didn't read. <laughs> and then when I finally checked in with it, there's all these messages and I'm going back and these guys are so on top of it and they did, ev- they, they did all the, all the hard work and I just get a record, which is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. I get you on the no time thing. I, I don't have time for anything. Any Like I used to say I didn't have time for anything. But now I really don't. Yeah. And it's kind of freeing in a way because I'm like, I can only do these things. Nothing sure. else can get through. Yeah. And, you know, I have a, a young child and he's super into video games. Yes. And so I spend, I'm not saying, I don't think it's a bad use of my time, but, you know, I spend a lot of time playing video games with my kid, uh, which is super fun. Um, it's something I don't think I expected to do with a new, a new kiddo, but he's, it's great. Uh, we play Minecraft. Ah, ever heard of it? <laughs> of course, uh, it's uh, it's the worst. Um, <laughs> it seems tedious. I've never played it's tedious. it. Tedious. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's 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 damn whatever. It's a it's a dumb game. But uh, then all of a sudden, no one's home, and I'm playing Minecraft. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> I can't do this. But it it's it is what it is. So. You're making your little world. You got some, uh, you're digging up some grass or whatever they do in that game. So I've been using Minecraft to teach my son Traver about um, uh, income inequality. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, I think, you know, everyone's heard the, uh, the, the work boots story. It's the, um, it's, you know, uh, someone who doesn't make very much money goes out and needs boots for work. And so they go and find these boots and they're $300. And they say, I can't, I can't buy those boots. I'm going to get these $40 boots and they last two months. Worst is the guy who makes a lot of money and he goes out and buys the $300 boots, but they last for five years. And so we, 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 have, we do the same analogy with uh, his pickaxes in Minecraft. Uh, the, the wood ones are really cheap, but they don't last very long. I don't know. It, it, we, I, I'm trying to uh, use a lot of that stuff as learning uh, because there's not a lot of learning that you're going to do in Minecraft. Yeah, I like that. Number one, it would be great to have a child and play video games with that child. But number two, to use that as a learning tool to teach about income inequality, which is probably something I would teach about too. And we're trying. I mean, it all sounds very good to me. What else are you guys playing? Anything else? Oh God, it's the worst. Uh, it's it's this game. I mean, I'm, I say that it's this game. Of course, I had heard of this game already. It's, it's uh, Among Us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not good. Um, <laughs> and what's funny? What's really funny is you have to look at a lot of this f- from the eyes of a six year old. Yeah, because he doesn't want conflict. And the game is about conflict. So what he'll do is he'll play a single player game with um like with bots. Yeah, and you can't lose. You also can't win. <laughs> um, you know, p- part of the game is you, like you do something and they vote on everyone talks and they vote on who's the bad guy or whatever. That doesn't exist because they're not real. So uh, it's just it, it's really fun to sit there and watch him do that. Um, I don't play that game. That's that's more of a I'm watching and making sure he's not like trying to talk to 50 year old men or whatever in the chat. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you got to watch out for the weirdos. Yeah. There, yeah there's yeah. a lot of, you know, I play war. I play a lot of Warzone. It's a very competitive online battle royale. And you would not believe 
the things that people say. I mean, so I don't I I, I don't play a lot of video games anymore. I, I I used to play a lot of like you know the shooter the shoot 'em ups, and uh, I would see all the time like dudes who would like get around. It was just a bunch of like racist trolls. Like you'd see like people make I mean, they make their little logos as and their swastikas or whatever, and like. I don't know if that's changed. Um, that stuff definitely turned me off from like playing online games. It uh, it still happens. It doesn't happen a ton, but sure. someone will have an inappropriate name, or mm-hmm. sometimes when you kill them, they'll use just the worst words that are out there. Yeah. So I think like you know, I think it's unavoidable, especially if you're a kid playing video games. But yeah. I think you just got to teach your kid like, look, these crazy weirdos are out there. You got to just ignore that stuff and stay away from it. Yeah. And I haven't gotten good at that yet. I think that's something that either comes with time or doesn't, but I know things are terrible. I know he's going to see terrible things. I just don't want to be there when he sees it. Or maybe I should, I I don't know. I, it's such a, it's such a weird thing. Imagine growing up in the age of the internet. I would have been in big trouble, big trouble. I remember I, uh, I used to have, I used to do like four different talk shows when I was a kid. I would just put a cassette tape in a recorder and hit record. Oh, I love this. And I would do voices and guests and all this stuff. And, you know, I think about that now and I'm like, oh, I guess that's why I'm doing this now. I just cir- <laughs> I just circled back. Yeah. And uh, one day, it was sixth grade and I was still doing these talk shows and I had some friends sleep over, these two guys. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I brought them into my world. I'm like, hey, here's this show I do. And then I like hit record and started doing the show and doing all these wacky voices. And I'll never forget the looks on their face. They were like, who is this weirdo? (laughs) And then after that, uh, things got bad and everyone started making fun of me. But that happens. We've all been there. I tell this not for sympathy, but to say that these guys just weren't on my level. You know, they did not understand the comedic genius and artistic merit of me. Well, you know, I mean, honestly, they're, they're, I know that you're sort of joking, but there's there's actually a whole thing there. I mean, like, uh, uh, immaturity is terrified of creativity. It always will be. It's it's you know, it's uh, anyone, and you know, I'm, I feel like I'm I've probably been guilty of that too. And I was immature forever. Um, maybe you still am. I don't know. But um, you know, you 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 hear a band, and it's not the thing that you just heard. And you go, that band sucks. Yep. You're like, no, no, they don't. They've done so good that they made a record. I mean, shut the fuck up. That's crazy. Exactly. I used to be an it, it sucks guy. I'm glad I'm not anymore. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And just, you know, I uh, when I was really young, I was just concerned with like acting and looking cool as, mu- as much as I could. So if anything was even a little weird, I'd be like, ew, no. Uh, that's, I'm glad I'm out of that. You know? Yeah, me too. So um, I just have to say, Mall Walker, this EP, I think this will be my... I think this will be a summer go-to record for me forever now. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's just so upbeat. It's like the perfect spring summertime music. You know, we we uh, part of the idea was to write up, you know, you know, we 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 don't know how to do things that aren't a little bit aggressive. It's yeah. just not we, that's what we listen to and whatever. Um, but like to try to be like super positive um and also like play like sad music and i don't i don't think it's very sad but um you know it's uh it i think it is a lot of positivity there even if it's not evident and uh, i don't know it, it, i i know I, I love that stuff like i love the you know tra- people having a positive mental attitude and i don't know just it, that was the that was the game behind that whole concept yeah it's upbeat but it's it has some emotion to it sure as well like uh don't park at the porn shop that's my favorite song right now very upbeat, but there's like kind of a sadness to it too, which I really like. And so we, uh, it, it's this place is gone now, of course, because everything in Austin that was here a week ago is gone. Yeah. But uh, it's this great DIY spot called Thompson Street. And it was, it shared a parking lot with this zebra painted porn store. <laughs> and so we used to play a game where we'd, you know, we'd load in or we'd be there to see friends' bands and we'd be sitting outside and a car would come in and we'd be like, all right, is it punk show? Or is it porn store? <laughs> and we'd see them and they'd like kind of hesitate and then pull into the porn. And we're like, ah, porn store. But there's a big sign on the front door um, said, don't park at the porn shop because, you know, if you do, you'll, you will get towed. So, there, you know, is it we kind of wanted to write a song about being, you know, in our 30s and playing punk shows with, you know, 21 year olds and how 
much fun it is for us now. It's it's, it's the it's the same it's the same level of enjoyment that it, that it was you know twenty years ago. I love the backstory on that. That's yeah. so good. Yeah. So that's it. And for me, Cole, you know everything's great. I don't is that is anything different? No, I'm working on the show a lot. Um, that's going good. I'm still working on this new band. We don't have a name yet. We we've got four songs we're working on. I hope to play a gig. Uh, this year, but I don't know if that's going to happen because we write slow. But we're we're finally getting on like an every week practice schedule. How often do your bands practice? Both bands try to practice once a week. If we have stuff coming up, we try to do two. Uh, that rarely happens, <laughs> and also we rarely both. I mean, Mo Walker has not been practicing. Uh, we've just been way too busy. Uh, Easy Parade doesn't miss a week. But that's because we're, you know, we're just an active band. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get where I think we are on a once a week now, which is great. I'd love to finish up five songs and then just get out there and start playing shows. My approach used to be too professional. I'd be like, we write the songs, we perfect the songs, we go and record them track by track in a studio. We have a release, we have a shirt, and then we go play our first show. Nah, you got to go rip it. No, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm because I tried to do that with my last band, and and the band broke up before we ever even of got. Of course, to- <laughs> you know, you you lose every bit of you know. There's so much momentum in writing, especially the initial bit of writing. You know, everyone's everyone's super stoked. Everyone, you, you can't wait to go back the next week. And then if you're not doing stuff or if you're just planning studio time or whatever, it's, it's brutal. You just, you gotta, especially if, you know, now that we're, we've been in bands before, so we know how to book a show without having a, you know, polished five song EP out on the internet. You can just go, Hey, uh, y'all are playing this place Friday. Can we open and I'll buy you three beers? And they're like, sure. And then you're playing a show. There you go. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm looking forward to that. I haven't played a gig since 2016. And I realized this uh, talking. Who was I talking to the other day? It might have been on the show. I don't remember. I've never played a gig sober. Ah, like I've been fucked up every single time I've ever played. And between my last gig and now I've gotten clean. So I will whatever this first gig is will be my first time playing sober. So that'll be cool. That'll be cool. Um, you know, I, I find that there's a different anxiety level and I'm not sure which one's worse. You know, I'm, I'm a, I have a high level of anxiety no matter what I do, if I'm drinking or if I'm sober or if I'm sleeping. Um, so I get it. Um, you know, I, at this point shows, I don't care. Uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, I, I care. I want to do good, but you know, beyond that, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me in the same way it did a while ago. But I, I think that if, you know, if you, if it's like, Hey, we, uh, you guys are on in 15 minutes and you're like eight whiskeys in, you're like, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to do this. So I think sober's sober's the, the way to go sometimes. Yeah. I, uh, I have anxiety before I do everything. <laughs> yeah. So I, I know exactly what to expect and it's going to be just fine. Yeah. Oh, it was the last episode I was talking about it with, with, uh, Tim Brown from loud sounds. And I was saying like, I used to get effed up and I would just go too crazy during the set and play sloppy. So I, I you know, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that anymore. No, I, I get that. I mean, I think mo- yeah. moderation is super important, especially if, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if easy praise at the point of this, but like people came to see you do stuff. Yeah. You can't just like fuck off. Yeah. Like, especially if you're in a band like Easy Prey, you can't stand up there and play like Oasis. No, that sounds great. We're going to do that all the time now. <laughs> new, new, new goal. Uh, but no, yeah, I mean, you know, you you, you have a thing and um, especially when you, you play like a fest and it's like, all right, we're on in eight hours. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I mean, there's just no chance that someone's not going to be like, I'm I can't. Or like who who gave Matt Molly? I don't even know what Molly is. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's especially when it's like a smaller show. I, it, I think it's uh, it's it's still tough. Yeah, and there there should be a good balance of going crazy but playing the instruments effectively. I think yeah. I can find that balance now that I'm not going to be comatose on stage. Yep, I get that. Well, that's it. That's it for this episode. We're out of time. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it, Cole? I enjoyed it. Excellent. And listen, we're back next week. So check in. It's going to be another great episode. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And until next time. <laughs>